Well, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar, which is tackling the full life cycle of returns. And we're thrilled to have you with us today. And we're looking forward to sharing some valuable insights on the retail industry, especially focusing on everyone's favorite topic, returns. Uh, and specifically, we really want to get into the unique opportunities to optimize them at various touch points throughout the returns life cycle. I want to first introduce myself. I'm Casey Kroos, and I'm the Chief Customer Officer at Optoro. I have the pleasure of working closely with our retailers, brands, and 3PLs to help them solve returns and turn returns into a, a strategic advantage. So I'm very excited for the con conversation today. Uh, before we dig in, I'd love to cover some quick uh, housekeeping items, and then we can get right into the contact, uh, the content here today. First, I want we want to hear from all of you. Uh, we encourage active participation. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please drop it into the Q&A uh, section, which is in the button at the bottom of your screen there. You'll see it called Q&A. And we'll aim to address some of those questions at the end of the webinar. And, and last, if you do hear something insightful or something that really resonates with you, uh, we welcome you to comment and share that in the chat for all to kind of see and participate and, and uh, kind of have some side dialogue going as we're moving through this here today. So, uh, but before we uh, get going here, I'd love to introduce our incredible lineup of panelists. Uh, each is a recognized leader and expert in the industry, and, and they all have a profound understanding of the impact the returns process holds for brands, retailers, and consumers. I'd like them each to introduce themselves to you and tell us a little bit about their organization and their role. And with that, uh, Pavan, why don't we uh, start with you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Casey. Uh, my name is Pavan Matani. I lead our returns and reverse logistics business at Viho. Viho is a post-purchase experience company facilitating incredible delivery and returns experiences for e-commerce purchases on behalf of retailers who care about customer experience. So we've rebuilt the carrier model from the ground up with technology and a crowdsource marketplace to provide that incredible delivery and returns and show that it can really improve customer loyalty and lifetime value and ultimately transform logistics from a cost center to true profit and customer lifetime value center. Thanks, Bob, and that was great. Uh, Gary, why don't we turn it over to you next, share a little bit about yourself and your company. Sure. I'm Gary Hunter, and you might tell I have a slightly foreign accent. I work for uh, Parcel Pending by Cordium. We are a 99-year-old French business, and we're involved in the parcel locker industry. We have around 19,000 parcel locker locations worldwide, about 7,000 in Japan and over 10,000 in North America. My role is to lead the global rollout of open locker networks, which is designed to streamline both delivery and return of goods to consumers. Thanks, Gary. Um, Melissa, could you please share with us with the attendees here? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Casey. So Melissa Valentine, I oversee sales for Locust Robotics in North America. Uh, Locust is uh, focused on the AMR autonomous mobile robot space uh, for warehouses and fulfillment centers. Uh, we work with some of the world's largest retail, 3PL, healthcare and industrial companies. Uh, to do things like substantially improving uh, productivity and throughput while reducing cycle times and improving overall profitability. So pleased to participate on the panel today. Thanks. Thanks, Melissa. And Amina, could you please do the same? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of our partners. Um, we are happy and honored to count every one of these speakers um, as our partners as we go about fulfilling our mission. And Optoro's mission is to make every return simple and efficient through great technology and partners, I will add, so shopping can be easy and sustainable. And really the title of today's webinar is very much our worldview for returns. We take a full life cycle approach. We'll be exploring that today in a variety of ways on the front end, on the back end, for the shopper, for the retailer, in conjunction with um, uh, partner technology such as and capability such as we have today. So looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Amina. Well, as you can tell, we've got a, a great diverse uh, set of speakers that are going to be able to cover uh, that full returns life cycle, which will be great today. Um, but before we jump into that discussion, love to set the stage with all of you. Uh, we know the returns can be a difficult and expensive challenge. Uh, and 
we really wanted to cover some of the top industry insights from 2023 moving into 2024 that really do reflect the state of returns and the challenges faced by many of you today. You know, first, online shopping just continues to increase substantially. Um, if you look at the current annual growth rate, uh, we see that continuing to increase at over 11% per year. So again, continued double digit growth of uh, online shopping. And obviously with that e-commerce comes a greater percentage of returns that do come back. And so if you look at that landscape and that lens of returns, we really see three key elements that uh, are stats we kind of wanted to call out uh, that you all are going to think about a little bit here. And the first is around customer satisfaction. And that's 95% of consumers are less likely to shop again after a negative returns experience. So really just the impact that returns can have is just an outsized influence of how shoppers feel about your brand and about that experience. Um, two, 62% of consumers would buy more from a brand based on having a good returns experience. So not only does it affect them negatively, it has a halo effect on uh, that shopping experience as well, with 62% saying they would buy more on that. And then last, uh, we do see that consumers who return items are four times more uh, profitable than consumers that who do not make a single return with a specific brand. So, you know, returns are a driver of loyalty. We see shoppers being willing to take more risks with their purchases, which means they do have more returns and, and returns are a good thing. They do drive loyalty as long as they're done successfully, efficiently, seamlessly kind of through that experiential process. So, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of sense there. Um, I'd love to turn over to our, our panelists uh, specifically, uh, hey, Pavan, Amina, so much you're touching on the front end here. Love to love to get your take on some of these uh, stats here. Yeah, I'm happy to, uh, to, to kick this off with some comments. I mean, I think the thing we talk to our retailer and brand partners about the most, I would say, is how do you take these, these stats, this reality, and make returns work for you in two different ways. Number one, I mean, without a doubt, you have to manage the cost of returns um, so that you're more efficient at it. I mean, typically re returns cost retailers about 50% of their margin. So it is a cost item that's critical from a transport side, from a cost to process the return side, you gotta solve that part of the equation. But the other part of it is, how do you actually leverage this 4X stat to make returns a point of engagement and trust for the shopper? And I think that's equally important to think about how do you actually take that moment of connection the shopper has with the retailer or the brand and make it a continued point of engagement. So you can't really look at one side of it, you have to look at both sides. And of course, with peak on our threshold, this is a really critical time for retailers to figure out how do you make sure you're ready for the inevitable onslaught that's going to happen post-peak from the return side. Yeah, I, um, I'll, I'll jump in on that. I, I want to echo a lot of those comments. And, you know, we sometimes hear people talk about how returns sometimes being a little too costly to solve and, and, and too challenging to solve. And, you know, it's just like this pesky and 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 costly problem. But you know, I think when you look at these stats, when when you think about the equation that Amina laid out, it's actually too costly to not focus on it and too costly to not solve this. You know, it, it, we sometimes think about cost in one dimension. You know, the dollars I have to spend to go get my product back, and, and sometimes a second dimension of you know maybe writing it off or not. But but the reality is the equation is more complex when you when you take into account these stats and you take in the, the different factors there, right? So. Yeah, you do need a foundation of cost-effective transportation to get these items back to you. But, you know, speed is an important consideration too. Will getting this item back faster allow me to capture more value from it than otherwise would have been liquidated, right? And then there's data and visibility. Can I plan my inventory and operational costs better when I have better control of when that return gets initiated and when it's coming back and how it's coming back to me? You know, and finally, there's that customer retention and customer profitability piece, right? So um, I spent so much money acquiring a customer in a very competitive market, you know, got them through the journey to go try my product out and make that leap of faith is the risk that they don't come back if they struggle to follow my return policy or return something they don't like. So, so yeah, I mean, returns are here to stay in case you called it, it's, it's growing with e-commerce and, 
you know, these, these ambiguous challenges have real costs to them. So, uh, you know, incrementally chipping away is, is a, is a challenging way to do it. And, you know, I think as you think about the, the concepts here and the stats on the screen, there's a way to step back, come back to the drawing board and, and align the incentives to actually do this better. Yeah, exactly. And I love Pavan, how you kind of mentioned, I mean, there really are, um, several customer touch points along that returns journey. And why don't we, we kind of get into this? Why don't we kind of frame this returns life cycle, how we all collectively think about that? Uh, Amina, could you just walk us through a little bit of the, this, the journey here? Absolutely. So one thing to bear in mind, as Pavan was just mentioning, is what is the cost of acquiring a customer versus retaining a customer? And in order to really retain a customer and manage your costs, you got to look at this on an end-to-end -end perspective. You can't solve just the left-hand side of the slide or the right-hand side of the slide and not connect the two. So that's what I find really exciting about today's conversation is you take a look at the front piece, right? So how do you actually organically, seamlessly, you know, really kind of effectively uh, and unobtrusively initiate that return in the context of that e-commerce conversation that's already happening with the shopper. So over here, we've got the Optoro returns portal, which is really designed to do two things, initiate that return. And oh, by the way, it's not on this slide because it's not the focus of today's conversation, but you got to capture that intelligence on why is that person returning it? And what can you do at that moment of engagement to figure out, can you present? Can you uh, do an instant exchange? Uh, a like for like or for a like for a different item to really continue that conversation up front. And then for the item that's being returned, that's where the middle piece really is so critical to managing the cost of transportation. If you can actually get consolidated shipping, right? That's the beauty of what um, Viho does and what Parcel Pending does in terms of making it easy for the consumer box free, label free, drop offs, pickups, um, uh, safe lockers, uh, such as we have on the screen here, in order to make that really easy uh, for the shopper initiated through uh, the portal they came in with, and then do that consolidated transportation to get that back in the warehouse. Now, one of the things that really matters to consumers is the time to refund, right? You don't want customer service calls to say, where's my refund? How does that work? And if you can actually integrate at every point along this journey and then use you know, the AMR capabilities that you'll hear about shortly through our partner Locus, for example, working in conjunction um, with, you know, we've got our supply chain software, our returns management software here in terms of how do you do that smart dispositioning? What's the optimal, um, you know, endpoint for that given item. The, the funny thing is the supply chain was really designed for a forward perspective. But if you think about the reverse logistics, think about all the complexity, all the costs that are involved in actually initiating, getting back, evaluating, and then optimizing where that item goes. It's really critical to really take a systematic approach to it. And really for something like apparel and footwear, you know, 80, 90% of those goods go back to stock. So getting that item back to stock to optimize their sale value, get it in the hands of the next shopper is really critical, which is why we're huge advocates of really kind of stitching together across the life cycle, all these different components that have to seamlessly come together in order to delight both shoppers and retailers and brands. Thanks, Amini. You said the word easy, which I, I love that word, just trying to focus on easy and simplicity as much as possible. You know, we have a saying, you know, returns don't have to suck. Um, so why don't we uh, switch into technology and specifically how technology is driving an easy and seamless just returns uh, and process here. So, uh, you know, we know that Retailers and customers are thinking about how technology can make things easier. Uh, many of you spend most of your waking hours really trying to leverage this for their benefits. So why don't we we'll jump into this? We'll kind of break it down a little bit first on Amina. If you could really at Optoro here with our front end returns portal, as well as our back end processing software, you know, you have a unique vantage point on technology's role in returns. So if you could share 
how your insights really of technology and how it's shaping that returns experience and the tech solutions that are really proving to be most beneficial to that process. Absolutely. So take um, within the returns experience our um, express return solution, which is what we're partnering with with Viho and with Parcel Pending and and other folks on uh, Staples and other folks to figure out how do you actually use technology to get the product back in the easiest manner possible. And I think you have to think how is consolidation really driving down costs for everybody, driving down emissions from a planetary perspective, uh, making that more sustainable. The name of the game is getting that product back to stock, right? If you have 80 to 90% coming back to stock, especially if you're in peak and that's a hot moving item, you wanna get that back um, into circulation as quickly as possible. So that's really the, the first step is to say how to use technology to look across brands and retailers to have the benefit of combined volume, ben, um, you know, be a net positive uh, for retailers and brands through an easy process for the shopper. The second aspect is really what happens when you receive all those items, right? You can't just solve that front piece of the equation. Um, you really need to figure out how do you use technology to more effectively and quickly receive. So you look at, look at stats like units per hour, time back to stock. I mean, ideally, as you're receiving it, can that item go back uh, to being listed on the e-commerce website to already get back to the next customer, like within a day? Um, really for the three PLs that we're partnering with, that's a kind of reverse and forward integration that they're benefiting from. And I think that's where robotics comes in, for example, to really expedite that sort of processing. Oh, that's great. Um, hey, Gary, I'd, I'd love your perspective here. You know, at Parcel Pending, you're using both software and hardware to solve the returns problem. Can you Can you elaborate? Yeah, certainly. I mean, the major role for the for our smart lockers is, is to ease the physical journey for the goods back into um, inventory, as I mean, it says. Um, I saw a stat, I think, that something like 16% of returns don't ever get made because they, they ride around on the backseat of somebody's car for the 30-day return period, and somebody hasn't managed to find a convenient way to get it out of the car and into the network and back. Now, not only does that, I believe the American word is, suck for the for the consumer because they, they're not going to get their refund. They've now got trousers that in my case would be probably too small. Um, but they're also potentially they're not going to get returned to stock in time to, to get that value out. So what we want to do is to put thousands of physical locations, postal lockers in on street corners, outside premises, close to where people live, where people work, where people play, to make that first mile really, really easy. And we've, we've added to that, as well as the kind of the hardware side, we've added label printers, so we can print shipping labels right there at the locker. We can consolidate returns en masse for carriers. And on the software side, we're able to integrate to multiple carriers. So in the UK, where our network is a bit more mature, we're integrated with DPD, with Every, um, with DHL, uh, with, the, with four of the biggest major B2C carriers doing help out and returns. So there's a single point that is hyper convenient for consumers to use. Thanks, Gary. That was great. And then Melissa, you have a very uh, unique vantage point here. And, and so in terms of leveraging technology for seamless returns, you know, how has the productivity improvement witnessed with Locust Bots really contributed to the handling uh, of returns and, and that process being more efficient? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Casey. And I think as Amina and other panelists have talked about, about profitable returns and time to restock and a number of value unlocks that uh, we know that Locust can assist with. And, and there are a number of kind of processes uh, as it relates to returns that Locust can help kind of automate, uh, make more efficient uh, and ultimately more profitable. And it starts with even the way that goods are received uh, inbound and just kind of transportation and movement of the goods. Uh, just kind of throughout the process of um, inspection and kind of other things that need to happen as uh, decisions are made. Uh, I've sometimes heard Locust referred to almost as like a liquid conveyor, being able to do some transportation of goods without needing to invest in bolt-down conveyor. 
And then we can support things uh, like sortation, um, movement of goods back to, to a restock, in-stock position. And these are kind of all things that we can do um, without needing uh, to add incremental headcount. Um, uh, we can actually do uh, quite a bit faster and drive a number of efficiencies. You don't have operators pushing carts. Um, so there's kind of a number of, of kind of technical advantages. And at the end of the day, it's just enabling the operation to be more efficient as uh, the returns are kind of processed and moved through the building and get them into a faster kind of restock in stock position uh, all through leveraging the AMRs. So uh, that's some of the, the ways that we can help. Thanks, Melissa. Well, let's get on to our, our, our next topic. You know, ultimately, you know, when it comes to retail, so much boils down first and foremost to the customer experience. And the stats we, we shared earlier really show that the returns experience can lead a shopper to either become a detractor or a, a loyal repeat customer. Uh, Pavan, you, you talk a lot, uh, you know, about today's customers and, and their expectations. You know, can you tell us, you know, how Viho is thinking about bridging the digital physical gap really to enhance customer satisfaction and brand loyalty? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the, the term you use, I, I really like. So, I mean, what we see in returns is one of the biggest sources of friction has always been around figuring out how to bridge that, that gap between the digital and physical world, as you called out. So extending that brand experience from the website or the app that you get online all the way to the customer's doorstep. Right so when when they when they touch and fill that product, so uh, I'm gonna call this out before, but forward logistics has evolved well to drive that customer experience when it comes to shopping and nailing a great delivery. But returns have main, remained pretty hard. We see a lot of friction in the process where a lot of times a consumer you have to print a label, you got to go find your own box, you got to go somewhere out of your way that may not be convenient at hours that's not convenient to drop it off. And people are busy, right? Everyone here is is pretty busy, I would think. And because of that, you've created a lot of friction. For the customer with these processes and so some of them procrastinate it's a stressful experience for everybody the brand loses out on the opportunity to get the item back faster and and it's really a lose-lose for a lot of people in the situation so um you know casey to steer your line returns don't have to suck uh and we think the first step to fixing this is align those incentive actually make returns very easy remove the need to print that label to you know allow customers to leave it at their doorstep or in a convenient drop a locker or drop-off location to be picked up and you know, communicate with them throughout the journey to make it seamless and give them some control back to actually do this right. Um, and when you bring together great technology and operations to bridge that digital and physical gap, I think that's where you'll really start to see this happen. Uh, you know, and a lot of people on this panel, I think, are, are doing really cool things around this. The best part, you know, in my opinion, is, is not only does it not have to suck, but it also doesn't have to break the bank either for a lot of, a lot of brands and retailers. Uh, we know that customers are willing to pay for convenience. We've done studies of thousands of customers that show that about 60% of them are actually willing to go pay for someone to take the friction out and pick this up from their doorstep or somewhere convenient for them. Um, so I think this provides a really great opportunity for brands to, to at least offer this as an option to their customers as a choice to improve the experience and, and increase their loyalty to the brand. That's great. You know, and, and Amin, I know you spend a lot of your, your waking hours thinking about consumer behavior when it comes to returns and, and also how... Uh, the return rate of apparel, for example, is is increasing. You know, can you elaborate on how this this consumer behavior has changed around returns and what that means for retailers? Yeah, I think that the first thing is that you know, as as people on this call know all too well, that apparel rate of returns are significantly higher. So you've got sort of the double whammy of e-commerce growing at a healthy clip, as you shared a few slides ago, and then apparel return rates being 30%. So then do you have those items riding along in the back of the cars? I love that visual, Gary, that you shared, or sitting in the corner of your house somewhere. So if you're like me, it's on your to-do list and you don't know when you're gonna get around to it and you want the refund. So it makes complete sense that, you know, Pavan's data, uh, suggests that people are willing to pay for the convenience. And I think this is a reality that's here to stay because, you know, your bedroom is now the new fitting room. And the, the challenge is, how do you figure out how to manage that expectation correctly for the consumer? So chances are you want to offer at least one free uh, method of returning an item, but then you want to really nudge and align what you're offering to people 
with the value of that shopper. So I think there's space here to have different conversations with different aspects of your customer base. If it's somebody who's a truly loyal, high value customer, they're buying a lot, they're returning a lot, that's a different return policy discussion you might wanna have with them than with an incidental shopper who's come to you for the first time. And in that case then, maybe you don't make the return policy a barrier to shopping, right? Because what you don't wanna do is to turn off that sale. You've spent an awful lot of money and time attracting that customer um, to you. So really the question is, how do you have a, a nuanced multi-pronged uh, lens as to how you figure out your returns options, your returns policy, your returns pricing, such that you're maximizing the consumer lifetime value of, of that shopper. And you're making sure the returns approach is not a one size fits all sort of solution. And I think that's a, a multifaceted discussion that is this worthy of having because it's hugely impactful. No, I love that. I think that that's where the magic happens when you kind of get away from that one size fits all. Um, hey, Melissa, it may feel odd, you know, to connect warehouse robots to to customer satisfaction, but walk us through the, the value drivers Locus provides for retailers, which really open up and afford a lot of different optionality in different areas. Yeah, I think this connects back to a lot of what I was saying earlier about uh, getting uh, merchandise and returns back to kind of an in-stock kind of sellable position. Um, but the picture is really kind of bigger with leveraging AMRs. So um, if you think about just kind of the end-to-end -end process in a warehouse in terms of kind of receiving, putting away, and then also picking uh, so we can support the fulfillment side of the business. But the real value buckets, you know, we're automating a lot of the, when you think of kind of unproductive tasks or time in the building, uh, which is usually walking. Uh, Metro Locus can come in uh, to provide to provide automation, and you know some of the value buckets around. You know we'll see things like two to three x productivity gains, um, kind of reduction in errors, reduction in safety incidents, um, improved kind of overall employee satisfaction, improved throughput in the building, reduced cycle times. Um, you know, a number of things I think that obviously are important, not only to retailers, but even uh, end customer being able to go on, uh, order something that may have been unavailable that now has been restocked, uh, get it faster uh, just by leveraging the AMRs. Uh, retailers can also uh, ensure they're hitting SLAs, customer SLAs and things like that uh, to get goods out the door faster. And even the ability to do more with less. I think in certain markets, uh, you know, there's, there may be... Um, uh, some uh, difficulties around real estate or even just existing sites busting at the seams and just the ability to increase throughput and kind of get more out of the building without needing to add kind of labor behind it. So I think those are just some of the value unlocks that it may extend beyond just kind of the retail side of, I mean, the, the return side of the equation um, and really kind of the whole end-to-end -end process within the four walls. Yeah, yeah got it. if I, if I yep. may, Casey, um, Melissa and I were, were talking not too long ago. I mean, one of the realities and the real important need for automation is to think about what happens, you know, post peak when the returns peak happens, right? So we have a, um, we have a customer who seasonally adds a lot of folks, right? You you beef up your folks, you got to get them trained and ready to go. And that's where I think you got to say, how can I have software really expedite the time to productivity, the time to value of that person. So they don't have to have some fancy tribal knowledge of, okay, if it's this item, here's what I got to do with it. Um, what I need to do with it to get the maximum recovery, for example. So there's, you know, receiving um, units per hour efficiencies, there's dispositioning. How do you have that smart disposition? So one of the things that was exciting for me to contemplate really was to say, for example, how do you take supply chain software um, in terms of smart dispositioning, for example, and marry that up with the capabilities of an AMR so that you've got you know, the benefits of the AMR connected to the smarts of dispositioning and where is this item going to go next? And I think those kinds of integrated use cases is really the future 
of how do you optimize uh, units per hour and recovery. So you've got both the costs and the recovery from a warehouse, whether you're an enterprise um, who's managing your DC or you're a 3PL who's got all these facilities and you got to get ready for uh, returns peak. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think it's a great reminder that, you know, making a warehouse operation run efficiently and, you know, reducing time to stock, those type of factors really reduces the friction, you know, in the customer experience. And so uh, this is great, great takeaways there. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned peak and, and post peak. So <clears throat> only natural, we, we, we shift gears there. Um, hey, we're, we're all thinking about returns peak right now, the return season, and it, hey, it's right around the corner. Um, but those in returns also know that after the busiest, you know, selling time of the year is also uh, the business busiest returns time of the year. And uh, it'd be great to take a, really a deep dive into the different angles of how retailers can prepare uh, for peak and then post peak in particular. Um, Gary, hey, you've talked a lot about the lengthening of peak season due to Black Friday. Uh, can, can you talk about how retailers can make this extra long peak season more successful in terms of returns? Yeah, sure. I, th I think what we're seeing, I, I mean, I can speak most personally about what we're seeing in the UK is that the, the Black Friday has become Black Friday week. And I now, I think we're in uh, day nine of Black Friday month. So I think I had my first Black Friday offer at 8 a.m. on the 1st of November. I And it was so good, I can't remember what it was. But they are already, the pressure on outbound is so high when Black Friday first crossed from the US to to Europe, and um, thank you very much for that. It was another one of your one of these strange gifts. Um, it absolutely destroyed the next day delivery uh, capacity in the UK. Um, nobody could deal with it. The unexpected demand that it created basically broke broke logistics. So over the sort of ten year, we've only had Black Friday for about ten years, probably maybe less. Over that time, it's become a season rather than a day. Uh, we don't celebrate Thanksgiving, um, so it's it's kind of an artificial day. So it's much easier for us to say November is the, the season of Black Friday. So the longer that season is, the, the less impactful it is on the, the, the poor guys that have to go out and deliver all this stuff. And the longer the season is, of course, that gives them more opportunity to, to make the returns. Bringing it back to parcel pending very briefly, our, our open network locker strategy is fairly new in the UK and it's going to be very new in the US. What we find is that at this time of the year, during peak, people are very busy. They have many, many things to do. They'll try a new solution. So we see more people adopt a new return solution during this period of time than any other. Um, our recent market research said 72% of UK customer consumers would be willing to try a locker. And if they're going to try a locker for the first time, it's going to be now. And so it's, it, this is an, an absolutely key part of our strategy is to be as ready as we can with as many lockers on the ground as possible to, to help deal with this. And, and we're seeing it. We're seeing uh, double digit week on week growth of parcel locker volume in the UK at the moment. That's great. You know, glad no we... that answers your question or not, but it's, it's no, it, you know, it does. It does. And, um, you know, appreciate we could send Black Friday across the pond. We'll we'll see what other holidays we can we can we can. Yeah, we, we we're not that keen on the Fourth of July either. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> we won't do that one. Maybe Thanksgiving will be next. Um, yeah, be good. It'd be two turkeys a year. Be great. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm gonna love to to get your insights really around you know what retailers need to think about when it comes to peak seasons returns. Yeah, first of all, if if we're sending you Thanksgiving, Gary, I want some of your bank holidays because every other day is a bank holiday, I think. Hey, we, we only have <laughs> Everyone's eight. nodding their heads. <laughs> we only have eight. You want the French, they have 11. I, I mean, you have 10, actually. You have more than we do. Okay, I'm glad you're keeping score. Um, one, one of the things that um, we have a lot of discussions with our retailer and brand partners with is what are your returns policies? And um, we did a study and it's something like nearly 90% of retailers revise their returns policies. And I think this is one of those things that just um, continues to iterate and change as more options such as box-free, label-free home pickups, and now parcels really come to the come to the fore as other options relative to good old mailback. And I think that 
you know, differential pricing of those various items is a really critical uh, component of the conversation and really thinking about when do you do refund, right? So if you are refunding once the item gets to the warehouse, then the kinds of automation we're talking about are really critical so that you don't inadvertently move the problem from, what, from one part um, of the uh, equation to another. So I think that is one thing that is big on people's minds. The other thing is um, how are you actually deploying software to help solve these problems. So I think exchanges is another uh, huge part of the discussion in terms of uh, the post-holiday season and how you leverage that. No, that's great. And kind of similar vein, uh, Pavan, love to get, you know, when you think about Vihos customers during peak season, you know, how do you see them optimizing the process? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, on our side, the, the main thing we're seeing is brands really thinking through the psychology of return policies and loyalty for incentivizing purchases during peak. So what I mean by that is, you know, peak is great. It's still quite a competitive time for retailers to, to get business. Uh, it's pretty common practice now for retailers to extend their policies, right? So 30 days become 60 days or 90 days through the holidays. So customers feel more comfortable and confident to make that initial purchase. Uh, they know returns are elevated around this time, but it's still a critical part of their growth and business model to do this. And I think a lot of our customers are starting to realize that they can lean into this idea a little bit more to build comfort and confidence with their shoppers with better returns policies and experiences. So it doesn't have to stop at just extending the window. You know, if you really want to differentiate and drive up things like cart conversion and give your customers that vote of confidence to shop more on your site at a time where it's it's very competitive to get shoppers dollars and also very lucrative if you do it right. Um, our brands are starting to see that it, making returns easy and seamless on top of an extended window is also pretty critical. So um, it's it's good thinking to understand the psychology of that policy extension. And, you know, I think very quickly becoming an expectation. So we're seeing that uh, start to take shape. Yeah, yeah we're, we're kind of hearing some of the same things there. Um, hey, Melissa, we talked a little bit earlier about um, kind of that dependency on temp labor during peak and you know, I've heard that AMRs can increase warehouse productivity, you know, two to three X. And so if we're thinking about that post-holiday backlog, you know, what are some, some creative ways retailers and brands can, can use automation with regard to returns? Yeah, thanks, Casey. And you kind of hit the nail on the head where, um, you know, peak season is obviously mission critical for, for retailers, for our, our retail and 3PL customers. And, you know, the nice thing with Locus is you can actually take in uh, short-term bots uh, to use them to support peak volumes without needing to carry them year-round. And there's a very large reduction on the reliance and need uh, to hire temp labor, which we all know is very difficult to do, to find, and then to retain uh, is very challenging. Um, and then even as you kind of come out of that, um, you know, high order fulfillment uh, for peak volumes, and you're then managing the returns volume that comes back in as a result, you know, the bots uh, that companies have used to support uh, peak volumes can then be in turn just easily moved over uh, to help support the workflows that we've talked about around processing returns, uh, moving them throughout the building and the dispositioning process and getting them back to an in-stock position. So it's just kind of interesting because as you have kind of the different processes to support peak on the front end with inbound and receiving, loading in retail uh, store volumes, uh, and then getting peak um, e-com volumes out and then supporting the returns at the end of that. Uh, there, those are all ways that the bots can be leveraged uh, throughout the season uh, to drive you know, better productivity, uh, better profitability, and just support the overall needs of the operation. I've had some retail customers uh, who didn't leverage AMRs during a peak season um, and wish they had uh, struggled and then came back around, implemented Locus ahead of uh, the next upcoming peak. Uh, and it was a key reason they were able to even get the volumes out. So lots of benefits to leveraging uh, things like AMRs and other automation to support what's really the most uh, impactful time of year for retail. No, well said. Um, 
I think that's something definitely for everyone to keep in mind. Uh, you know, and obviously when we we get through uh, the peak season and they, the returns, they were off into 2024 again. And, and I really wanted to create some some open space with all of you just to really get your uh, insights and thoughts on major changes you see coming up in 2024, um, or, and even perhaps what you think is going to stay the same, uh, potentially, if, if you find that relevant. So why don't I I'll go around to each of you and love you to kind of share some of your predictions uh, for what you see ahead. And uh, Gary, why don't we why don't we start with you? Well, we've seen a few start of changes in the UK where some of the really big e com players, particularly in, in um, apparel, are stopping offering free returns as a given. And they're either doing that in a selective way where they're picking out um, troublesome customers, customers that are serial returners and withdrawing the right to, of free returns to them. So if, if I were to make a prediction, I think I, we touched on it very briefly at the beginning, free returns is probably the number one marketing tool for to get somebody to try your brand for the first time. If you're not sure of the quality of what I'm selling or the sizing or whether the colors are accurate on the website, free returns gives me that comfort to give it a try. But after I've given it a try and I'm loyal, do I really need to have it for the long term? So my prediction is that we're going to see big data, AI, start to become really personalizing that returns experience, monitoring the people that are buying five items and returning four every single time, doing it in real time and saying, look, Casey, enough is enough. You know, th this time you 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 either buy what you want or you're going to have to pay to to return it, because I th I think longer term the environmental impact of this stuff, the sustainability of it, the loss in value of the stuff when it is returned is just going to become too overwhelming. So I think whilst it's great, the marketeers say no, don't do it. Our our sales drop three percent if we take the free returns off the website. I think we can do it more smartly in the back end and really use new big data tools to get clever about how we offer and to whom we offer. I was wondering how long it was going to take till we, we got AI on the table. Uh, and, and it's the boring locker guy with the dull metal boxes that brings it up. What were the chances? <laughs> Would not have predicted that, speaking of predictions. But uh, no, I think you're, you're spot on there, Gary. Um, Melissa, love to get some of your thoughts. Oops, sorry, I had the mute on there. Uh, no, appreciate yeah, sorry, that. Sorry, my, uh, my headset That's... dropped too. Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at you and you were you were looking at me at the same time. Um, but what I was just curious about is, you know, with the predictions here, you know, what, what do you see in your space and kind of radiating out? Yep, so uh, I think we'll continue to see challenges uh, around uh, finding labor. We hear that uh, from just about every customer we have and every market we have. Um, I think that's only uh, going to continue um, or perhaps even be more problematic, uh, just fighting for that same pool of labor uh, and fighting to, to keep labor in the building is kind of a major, major challenge. Um, I know things like um, inventory shortages or being kind of in the wrong location uh, continues to be a top challenge uh, for retailers. Um, and then, frankly, just the overall uncertainty and what's happening in the economy and the market, um, how things will play out uh, next year is still uh, uncertain. Um, and we're really in a little bit of a, a wait and see mode. Yeah, definitely uh, the macroeconomics. Uh, a question for us all that we're going to be watching closely is particularly how performance happens during during this peak season. Um Pavan, what, what are you seeing, uh, kind of what's ahead for us all in 2024? Yeah, I think, um, you know, a lot of the themes that we talked about are, are I think, are going to continue to hone true, right? If you, you boil that down and break it down into a couple of factors, it's it's cost and experience as, as real North Stars and, you know, pushing to think through those both holistically, right, and across all the dimensions we talked about today. So I think that that guiding, guiding North Star will remain the same, but different flavors of how we get there and, and different opportunities for us to tackle those as you as you think about the holistic equation. Um, you know, of course, we're seeing amazing innovations on the automation on the cost side here. Um, I think you're going to see a lot on the experience side as well. And when you find that magical overlap across those two, you can actually find better and cheaper solutions. So um, I think I think honing in on those, thinking through those holistically, 
uh, and then understanding how you can pair some of these newer solutions together will just lend itself to game-changing opportunities for brands to evolve in 2024, continue to give an incredible experience and, and find ways to do that in a very cost-effective operating way. Hmm. I like that Venn diagram overlap there and that sweet spot. So um, I think that's a good good goal for everyone. Um, I'm going to turn it out to you on this one. Uh, you know, hey, what do you see in, in 2024 for, for retailers and brands and what's going to change and what, what maybe stays the same? Yeah, I think just building on uh, what my colleagues here have brought up, I think in 2024, retailers and brands need to think about an and and not an or. So I think a lot of times the way the problem is framed is to say, I can either reduce the cost of returns or I can delight my shoppers and invest in CLTV. And I think that or needs to become an and because I think you have to do both. And I think you really need technology in order to be able to do that kind of, you know, kind of dual thinking, that kind of optimization. And, you know, as my locker friend here mentioned, I think that starts with data science and machine learning and understanding what's the value of your customers and how do you differentiate what kind of returns experience you offer to each of your customer segments um, so that you know who's a trusted shopper and you know what sorts of, whether it's instant repurchase or it's your pricing strategies for each of your returns options. I mean, the reality is 60% of customers are deterred by returns fees. So how do you use this really powerful you know, lever, this really powerful tool you have to incent the right behavior to the right folks? And then absolutely automation and the speed and you know, reducing your returns cost in your warehouse by 40, 50%, which is like what we do today, that needs to come in. Um, systematically, if you add robotics to it, it's even more of a force multiplier. So you got to connect the front end to the back end and then really figure out how do you have that data um, really help grow your business and really make it sustainable in a variety of ways, right? Sustainable for you as a retailer and a brand, sustainable from an environmental and circularity perspective, sustainable in terms of the trust and the engagement you're delivering to shoppers. You got to look at all of these different constituencies, you know, through a holistic lens. Great. Thanks, Alvin. Just really good insights from everybody. I appreciate it. I'd love to Pivot now, if we could, to our audience and, and put some questions. So um, we've already got a few that have been submitted. We'll start going through those. If uh, those in the audience want to hit that Q&A button at the bottom and type one in, we'll try to field some of these as we go through here. Um, I'll have a few I'll kind of direct to the right person, and maybe some we can kind of keep open a little bit. Uh, one here is around uh, uh, home pickups, Pavan. It was, how does a pickup person distinguish between multiple returns from a customer if there are no labels on the items? Yeah, great question. Uh, magic. We uh, we have a we have technology that integrates with our brands that allow us first and foremost to get some data upstream about what is actually being returned, right? So so with the full stack integration, when you think about you know what, what Amina said about connecting all the pieces, if you do this right, you're able to get that information upstream. The customers can schedule this. Um, we get descriptions of what that item should be from both the brand and from the shopper. A lot of times they'll give us very clear instructions in terms of what packaging it's in, what type of material it is, where it is on their doorstep. Um, you know, we can exchange photos, if, you know, at, at some point as we think about building this through a native app. Um, and then our drivers have pretty clear instructions on, on what to go get. So, so that's typically how they're able to distinguish. Uh, and so data visibility and, and communication is, is really key. We also have like real-time chat so if there's any issues, there's sort of a text message or in-app messaging experience where um, both our driver partners or uh, customers can interact with each other in real time. Yep, thanks. If, if, if I may add to that, the one word answer to that is data uh, because we serialize or license plate every single item. So when we're working with Viho and the drivers and what's happening, we've got complete visibility to where each RMA is along that journey. So therefore you can have, you know, multiple brands, multiple retailers all riding along in the same car, getting the benefit of consolidation through serialization and data visibility. Thanks, great addition there, Amna. Um, 
Another one we had here is around uh, that return rate. It was kind of an increasing return rate for apparel or in general. And uh, this person want to get a little sense of like what's driving those increases as you all see it. I'm happy to jump in if yeah, if, go ahead. I, I was going to say I, I think it depends on how you measure this. So, so how many outbound packages end up with a return being generated, or is it what percentage of the value of the outbound goods end up being returned? You know, so and then and, and then the third measure is how many of the items are sent out come back. So there's there's net. I don't think it's a single measure on the return rate. I think a lot of the time people are getting very comfortable with our ordering multiple items with no intention of ever keeping them all. You know, so you this classic of, you know, you buy three sizes, the size you think you are, the size you'd like to be, and the size you actually end up keeping. Two of them are always coming back. That isn't a failure of, of, of the purchase. That's an intent from the customer. And I think Amazon launching Amazon wardrobe is putting that people in the mind to, well, don't worry about it. Just get five. Don't, don't just get, don't, don't, don't get the one you think you need. Get loads. So it's kind of normalizing uh, the return process. And I think this, you know, the indiscriminate way that everybody can return anything they want all the time for free. And yeah, you know, one company here was doing a 30, 365 day return window. You know, it, it, just to try to be differentiated and get stuff sent back. So the, it's, the, it's the marketing of returns as a as a as a customer capture tool. I think is driving it. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think bracketing behavior is here to stay. Um, so unless you have ordered a specific items from a specific brand and you're just ordering another one of the same, you're going to, you're going to do that. Right. So that's the, that's the bedroom where your house has taken the place of a, a dressing room in a store. Um, and that dynamic is here to stay. So I would say that to whomever asked, I mean, the NRF should be publishing their their new study as the NRF January show comes on they'll they'll do a, a state of the union for 2023 and that's really a good source to look at you know the 800 billion dollars in total returns between in-store and uh and online for example that was for 2022 yep and and this is another one that came through that segues a little bit off of uh kind of return rate but it, it's actually broadening it and says, hey, returns are, are difficult uh, to measure other than the rate of returns, but they really want to get a sense of other metrics beyond that return rate that they should be thinking about. Um, is the main one just avoiding returns? What are some of those other key KPIs that you all are thinking about and, and that our retailers and brands and 3PLs and the call should be thinking about? Yeah, I think one is taking a look at what is the return rate um, along a number of dimensions. So you can take a look at how much is a given shopper ordering versus returning, right? So that could be another metric to say, what's your relative return rate based on um, what's the order value um, that you're ordering? How often are you ordering? We were uh, talking with one of our customers recently, and i um, this was somewhat of an outlier, but, you know, she was telling us about how this one shopper ordered thousands of dollars worth of dresses, maybe it was for a wedding or something like that, um, or a special occasion, but they ended up keeping, um, you know, a significant portion much higher than everyone else. So like, if you were to just look at it in the absolute and just say dollars of return, you might ding that person. But if you look at how much they're mm -hmm. buying and their pattern, so I think it's really important to get granular in the data to understand what is the profile of the shopper, what's the profile by what kind of category that is, what kind of skew that is, and how do you understand you know, where that's a bad return versus a good return, if you will. Yep. Uh, we have another one here that is really around uh, it's a question of like, hey, good solutions for CE returns. And, and maybe we broaden it a little bit too, to like, how are you all thinking through different product categories and returns and, and, and some of those different aspects? I will jump in if there's no one else who wants to who wants to take that. So so the the rate of 
um, return back to stock is drastically different for CE items than apparel items, right? So just take that as an example. So for CE items, that's like 30%, and for apparel, it's 80 to 90%. And certainly what needs to happen in terms of test and grade and refurbishment and whatnot is a very different flow uh, if you're like a Best Buy who happens to be one of our customers, that's a very different flow than if, say, you're a Gap um, and you're you're handling apparel. So it's really important to figure out on a relative basis what does good look like and what is that, you know, how do you define what the goalpost is in terms of rate of return, rate of return by item, and even within C the CE category, one kind of, you know, like a drone return versus like a phone return would be drastically different, right? A telephone. So I think it's very nuanced in terms of, you know, what the what the benchmark is and and where you need to be. Yeah. And also just the the extent of channels, uh, you know, CE just has so many more channels you have to really power and uh, out there as opposed to some some other segments. Uh, but I, I love that answer I'm not hey last one and then I think we're uh at our time and is is really maybe it might be for for you Gary somewhat I think it's, you'd be a great person here it's, it's really around the evolution of returns in Europe compared to US and UK markets so a little bit internationally what what do we see as some of those differences for Europe versus UK versus the US so I, I can give you a, a 30 bit of bit of 30 second bit of insight which I find think you'll find quite intriguing UK and the US are extremely similar we are like the 51st state, so there isn't a huge amount of difference. The return rates you're talking about could be the UK return rates, 20% overall, 30% in, in apparel, slightly higher in female apparel than male apparel. All the parallels, uh, all of the parallels, too many L's, are absolutely there. Germany, for example, um, we have customers in Germany um, in the apparel world that have an 85% return rate, 85, because they have a post-pay model. You don't even have to pay with your card up front. It's a, it's a much more cash-orientated um, country. They send you the goods. You sift through what you like. When you're finished, you fill out a form. You send everything else back, and then they charge you for what you keep. So if you really want to have your nightmare return scenario, don't pay. Don't ask people to pay up front. They tried it in the UK, and being British, we just stole everything, and it was a disaster. Um, but, it, but what's really interesting is, with it, I mentioned right at the beginning, this huge network we have in Japan, the return rate in Japan is around 1% of goods. Even in apparel, it's about 1.6%. So it's a 20th of, of what it is in the, in other in the, in the kind of the Western world. Um, and this is a massive cultural difference that we observe every day there. And, and I find the whole thing fascinating. We don't have enough time to talk about it. No, thanks. Thanks, Gary. Some great insights there. Well, hey, we're at the, the end of our time. Um, Hopefully you all really enjoyed the, the different topics and things we were covered. Uh, we will be sending out a survey after this webinar. And so we, we do welcome the feedback. Uh, also uh, things that did stand out to you. And if you do have some questions, there are several of these questions we didn't get to. Uh, try to write a few of them down here. Uh, welcome you to put those into that survey and we're glad to follow up uh, with the right panelists on some of those, those questions. Uh, but uh, hopefully you got something valuable. If you have a colleague who couldn't attend, we will be sending this out on demand later. So, uh, hey, be on the lookout for that. And then last, on, on behalf of myself and the panelists, we want to thank each and every one of you that, that really joined today's webinar. And, and I also want to thank all of our distinguished panelists for, for their time today and, and the insights they shared. So uh, thanks, and everyone have a, a wonderful rest of your day.